It's time we take an old iPod into the modern age, with features Apple never envisioned this device with having equipped. That includes solid state storage, Bluetooth and haptic feedback. For this project, we'll be starting out with an iPod 7th generation, the last iPod of this form factor. But as we're soon to find out, this iPod doesn't take nicely to modifications. But that didn't stop me from getting it working in the end. I've purchased several parts for this upgrade, including a Bluetooth transmitter, various adapters and a Samsung haptic motor. I also have two sizes of batteries. Which one we'll use will depend on the amount of room left after installing the upgrades. Opening a 6th or 7th generation iPod is more difficult than most. But this one needs a battery replacement anyway, so I thought it'd be a good fit for this project. I used a series of tools including a razor blade to create a small opening between the rear and front panels. These two pieces are clipped together with some of the strongest clips known to man. Previous models with plastic fronts are easier to open, as the plastic is more forgiving and allows the clips to become detached far easier. Nevertheless, I persisted. I found this 0.1mm metal screen opening tool worked quite well, as not only did it fit between the two pieces, but it was also thin enough that it didn't warp the sides of the back panel. With a great deal of patience, I got the iPod open. Now the battery can be detached before the iPod can be opened to one side, revealing the battery and hard drive. The battery in this iPod is swollen and expands even further when charged, which creates a pressure spot on the screen. I'll start by removing the old hard drive and battery. Despite its age, the adhesive holding the battery in place is still very strong, so I'll have to use some alcohol to soften it. When removing the battery, it's critical to pry on the right side only to avoid damaging the hold switch cable. In its stock configuration, there isn't any free space inside the iPod. However, by switching to solid state storage, we are gaining some space inside the device. However, I forgot to account for the size of the CF to micro SD card adapter. With that installed, we no longer have enough space. Our mods will interfere with the battery. I had a hunch that most of this CF to micro SD card adapter would be wasted space, so I began unclipping the faceplate. I discovered that there was no free space inside, but that doesn't mean it's game over there is still space we could gain by removing the plastic casing. While it doesn't look like we've made any new space at all, in reality we didn't need much more to make this work. Test fitting the new components on the storage card, we can see that they now fit. We just need to make sure that we insert the adapter the correct way as it now lacks the plastic case, which would usually prevent such a thing. Test fitting our new storage and battery, we can see this iPod is now prompting us to restore in iTunes which is exactly what we want to see. Now comes the hard part. I want a power source that only switches on with the iPod. I thought I might be able to hack into the adapter, but it's only outputting one volt. Unable to find such a point easily, it was time for plan B. Use a switch for switching the Bluetooth on and off. iPhone mute switches were the way to go. They're tiny and I should be able to repurpose one. An iPhone 4 switch looked the best. However, I couldn't easily access its solder pads so I opted with a switch from an iPhone 3G. Using a multimeter, I could understand what pins I need to solder to. As for placement, I didn't want to cut out any holes or modify the exterior of the case. So instead, I'll install the switch at the base of the headphone jack. It will require a special tool to switch on and off, but it's still hidden. If you could find a latching button, that would be a better choice, but a switch was all I had. But there's a black box in the way. What is it, you ask? It's the buzzer that buzzes every time you scroll through the menu. We'll be substituting it for a haptic motor from a Samsung phone, which will not only give the device a more modern feel, but also allow for the Bluetooth switch to fit in its place. I'll need to enlarge the hole slightly so we can better access the switch. I'll need to extend the wires where the buzzer was located. These will later connect to the haptic motor. For wire, I just repurposed some Cat1 telephone cable. I'll connect two wires, one to the top pad and one to the lower right pad. The lower left pad will remain unused. Now we can proceed in removing the whole headphone jack and hold switch assembly, as we now need to tap into the headphone output. The wires connected here will feed audio to our Bluetooth transmitter. 
meaning we'll still retain our headphone jack. Under this white cover is where we're going to need to attach three wires. Black is ground, white is left, and green is right. Something we'll have to remember when it comes time to hook up our transceiver. Now our modified headphone jack cable can be reinstalled. To help with Bluetooth reception, I opted to cut a small section of the display bracket to allow for the signal to pass through. This consisted of removing the faceplate and LCD, before marking and cutting, as well as filing the display bracket. After which, it can be reinstalled. I added some tape around the edges to prevent the Bluetooth transmitter connections from shorting against the edges of the display bracket. It's now time to get the transmitter wired in. I'll need to extend its pair button with a couple of wires to enable us to use the button when the device is closed up. On the other side, I'll begin attaching the necessary wires, starting with the power wires. Now is a better time than ever to get that power switch wired in. Preceding that, there are the three wires running to the headphone jack. They need to be attached to their corresponding pad. With a bit of tape to prevent any shorting. With the Bluetooth done, it's time to get the haptic motor's two wires attached before gluing the power switch in place behind the headphone jack. With the glue dry, we can see our concept in action. Now it's just time to connect the Bluetooth module to power by tapping into the battery. We'll need to open it up to do this and solder the wires directly into the battery's BMS. A shot I framed perfectly so you can see exactly what I'm doing. But once it's connected, we can see the module now light up. There is just one more modification we need to do to the hold switch. I need to cut off its alignment post and reattach the switch using only the side screw. This will allow the switch to be depressed. I can now glue the Bluetooth pair button behind it. Pressing down on the hold switch will now activate the button. The battery will need to be glued in quite well to prevent the switch from sinking back inside the iPod. With our modification now complete, it's time for the iPod to be reassembled for a test. I'll use adhesive to hold the Bluetooth board and haptic motor in place. Thanks to our modification, there is now quite a few wires that need to be routed correctly between the two halves to allow the housing to close. It's important to test the iPod before closing it up, as these devices are very hard to open. I'll be sure to put electrical tape over exposed electronics to prevent it shorting against the Bluetooth board. Once the storage is attached, I can now loosely close up the iPod for a test. Powering it up, we can see the Connect to iTunes screen. As this SD card is blank, we need to install the iPod software. With a few simple clicks of the mouse button, the software begins to download, only for it to immediately error out after downloading. The storage was showing up in disk utility, but no matter what I tried, the iPod would not install the software. Different cables, different computers, different operating systems. It made no difference it wasn't installing the software. I even tried installing a micro drive from an iPod mini. It too wouldn't install the software. I thought I must have damaged something with this iPod, so I resorted to connecting the original 128GB internal hard drive. To my surprise, it booted up without issue. The problem is, we can't use it as it doesn't fit with the modifications. But I had one last option. Something that would have to work. I've come this far and have already missed the video deadline. There was no turning back now. I need to remove the ZIF to SATA adapter from my daily 5th generation iPod and install it inside this 7th generation. After all, if it's been working in the iPod 5 for years, it has to work in this newer model, right? That was it. I was fed up with this iPod 7th generation. I was going to demonstrate this modification no matter what. Unfortunately, it won't be in the 7th generation iPod. It will be in my trusty daily 
iPod 5th generation. Thankfully, the back panels are interchangeable between the two models, so I just need to reinstall my storage card and attach everything as if it was the 7th generation iPod. While the software failed to install on the 7th gen, it certainly did a good job of wiping the SATA SSD, so I'll need to reinstall the iPod software once again. But on my 5th generation, that went without issue. There was a few other things I had to change to make the modification work on this older iPod. I needed to extend the wires for the haptic motor, as it was now going to be located on the other side of the device. I'll also apply some tape on top of the exposed electrical connections so that the Bluetooth board doesn't short out against my SATA adapter. Now all that's left to do is apply a little bit of adhesive on top for the Wi-Fi board and get everything reassembled and closed up. Making sure to properly route all the cables so they don't get trapped in any of the display clips, reconnect the battery and press the iPod back together. And we're done. So this is it, a modernized iPod. With a press of the hold switch, we can connect to a Bluetooth device in range and stream music wirelessly, a feature no iPod Classic ever had. And while the new haptic motor sounds like an uneventful feature, there's just something about it that makes this iPod feel like a much newer device. Because instead of hearing 8-bit clicking sounds, you can now experience high-quality vibration as you peruse your list of songs. And we've managed to fit it all inside the slim iPod model. If you're doing this yourself, I would highly suggest using the thicker casing as it would make such a modification vastly easier. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, consider subscribing and check out the custom tech playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.